Good afternoon. Time for Coffee with Rob. We're in Mark chapter 3. This is study number 11. Uh, welcome to the next week, Monday morning. Oh, well, Monday afternoon now, I guess. But hope everybody's doing good. Don't forget, um, please do me a favor. Like, subscribe to the channel if you like what we're doing. Please follow along. We're going to go all the way through the book of Mark. And the next book we'll do is maybe we can get a vote or a consensus vote to go through together uh, one of the books. Or even problem passages. People are... Um, having trouble understanding. Love to help out with that. So we're in Mark chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. This is study number 11. Um, we already know that uh, the plot is out to kill Jesus. The Pharisees have plotted with the Herodians against Jesus Christ. So he knows the plan. He knows the full plot at this point. And so he withdraws. In verse 7 of Matthew, excuse me, Mark chapter 3, verse 7, it says, Jesus withdrew. With his disciples to the lake. Now this lake is obviously Galilee. He's in the Capernaum area, Galilee area. And um, he has his disciples. So remember Galilee, Lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee, uh, Sea of Tiberias. All refer to the same body of water uh, in northern uh, uh, Israel. So, uh, and a large crowd from Galilee followed him. Why? Because they had heard he was doing uh, many things, many miracles. So many, this is interesting. You see this here a few times. Uh, a large crowd, many people, and another crowd. It's used very uh, about four times here that there's a large amount of people call, uh, following him. I think the Greek word here is like plethora or plethro, uh, which we use to have like uh, many opportunities or many things like, I don't know, in a basket or something like a lot of things, a plethora of things, a plethora of ideas, many ideas. So many people, a plethora of people. When they heard what he was doing, they came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Edomia, and the regions across the Jordan. His fame is spreading, not just from Galilee, where he was, not just near Jerusalem, not just near Nazareth, but his fame is now spreading countrywide. The crowds are beginning to follow him. The word is out that there is a man speaking with authority. There is a man uh, doing miracles. Uh, there is a man who claims to be the Messiah. So this is big news. He is like a big celebrity. And so people are following him and crowding him as if Michael Jordan just walked in the room or LeBron James or whoever it might be, uh, some famous individual. Uh, I guess Taylor Swift is huge. So here, here she comes. Here they come. Here come these famous people. And the crowds are crowding around. The typical of today is was the same back then. Here comes Jesus. So many people came up to him from all the country and across the Jordan, from Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples, that this is interesting because he was usually walking around the towns, walking around the lake, and people were following him. But this time, it's a little different. In Mark chapter 3 here, it says that he had to have a small boat ready for him because as the crowds pressed in, he had to get away from them, get in the boat, and push off shore just a little bit so that the crowds wouldn't attack him. That's really what's happened. It's like the paparazzi's trying to attack him. So I looked up some of the words. The word in um, verse 9 here is uh, thipato, the crowd, thipato. What they wanted to do was seize him violently and hold on to him, which is typical of a big star. Now, this is obviously Jesus Christ, the Messiah, but it's very similar to somebody very popular, very famous, walking through town and people becoming uncontrollable. I would say probably like Elvis Presley. Women would go crazy grabbing him, pulling his clothes. And so Thipato, they were crowding him. They wanted to seize him violently. They wanted to hold on to him. Verse 10, Epipato, they pushed forward. They were pushing for him so hard they were going to fall on him. And, and and maybe even crush him in the crowd, which, as we know, happens in concerts, soccer games, football games, things like that. People get crushed because of the crowds. So Jesus tells the disciples, hey, pull a boat up for me. I'm going to get in this boat, and we're going to push off shore just a little bit so that I don't get smashed out here while I'm preaching. So he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him. And this is crushing and holding on to him. For he had healed many, so that those with diseases... We're pushing forward. Now the diseases are coming. The people with, because remember, he has authority over demons. He has authority over disability, 
over disease and so on. Jesus has showed his authority and his miracle working power. And word has got out. Uh, the people are crushing in. And so that's verse 10. People are crushing in. They're trying to push forward. They're trying to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him even. This is speaking about his fame. I think Mark is really pushing into his fame and popularity right here. The crowds, the crowds, the crowds. People pushing in. People crowding. People grabbing on him. Wherever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. Now this is a fact. They know who Jesus is, the evil spirits do. They fear him. They believe he exists, but they do not believe in him as Lord. They are not going to repent. They are not going to worship him. They only know his power and that he has authority over them. He could speak the word and their existence would be over. He, he can do whatever he wants. There is no equal to Jesus Christ except the Father or the Spirit. But he gave them strict orders not to tell anyone who he was. Why? Because he doesn't need demonic endorsement. He doesn't want his name associated with demons. So don't go say who I am. I don't want you using my name. I don't want you preaching in my name. Which is really interesting because as we push forward here in verse 13, he tells the disciples just the opposite. He tells the demons, don't go preach in my name. But he's about to tell the apostles or disciples, to go preach in his name. So that's inter pretty interesting. So as we go from verse 11 and 12, after he tells the demons not to preach in his name, he says that Jesus went up on a mountain in verse 13 and called those he wanted. So he just tells the demons, you cannot preach in my name. Do not preach in my name. But then he sends out this equivalent of, and you can quote here if you want, uh, royal summons he summons those that he does want to preach in his name he just told the demons no now he pulls in the 12 apostles very specific he calls them in and gives them the authority to preach in his name he calls those who he wanted this is the royal summons he's calling him and the king is calling in his men and they came to him and verse 14 says he appointed the 12 and the word here i looked this up poieo is mean he created something new this is the first time you're going to see the apostles, the, the, the office of apostle. We have prophets. They all talked about the Christ that was to come. Christ came, and now he's beginning a brand new thing, this office of apostle. Those who are called and cha challenged or tasked with preaching in power in the name of Jesus Christ. So he's starting something new. He's creating something new. He's creating the office of apostle. And we're going to look at that in a minute because there's varying beliefs here. And I'm on the side that says that the office of apostle no longer exists. Why? Because nobody has seen Jesus face to face in this day and age. Nobody has had the royal summons in this day and age to the point where Jesus has given them authority to go out and preach in his name face to face. Those That was a unique position for the apostles, for the authenticating of Jesus Christ and the church, the beginning of the church. They went in, in power in his name. And the office created was equivalent to, to, so if an apostle showed up, the office that Jesus gave them and the position that Jesus gave them would be equivalent as if Jesus stood in front of somebody then himself. If the apostle was in front of you, then it had the same power as if the king was in front of you. An assault on the king's men is an assault on the king himself, for lack of a better example, but that's the equivalent of this office. So he appointed the 12, designating them apostles. He began something new, P-O-I-E-O, P-O-I-E-O. That's the, the Greek word there. He designated apostles that um, they might be with him and that he might send them. So this is a brand new thing he's beginning. He's empowering them. He's sending out the 12. They have authority to drive out demons. And these are the 12 he appointed. Now I'm going to look at Ephesians 4 here in a second. And so they're named. They're all named here. Simon, Peter, James, John, which he changes their name to Bo Boerenges, which means sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Zelop, Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So all the, all the apostles are named here. And I just like to say that some people feel that they are apostles in today's age. And I'd say, if your name is not listed here, you are not an apostle. I'm sorry. And I know that there are churches that ordain apostles. Now, there are pastors, there are teachers, there are evangelists. And so at that point, 
Let's go to uh, Ephesians 4. This is why I bring this up. There's a time and a place for each position, a time and a place for each calling. And um, Jesus is starting something new. The office is apostle. Those that walked with him, those that he personally teaches, those that he gave the royal summons to, and those that he gave the power to go out and preach the gospel uh, in his place. And so we see here in Ephesians 4, um, Ephesians 4.11, uh, well, let's go to 4.10 just for a minute. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens of earth to fill the whole universe. This is speaking of Christ. He came down to the earth, and while he was here, it was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service. So that the body of Christ might be built up until we all reach, remember, key word, I've talked about this before, unity. Denominations are not unity unless we're speaking the same voice, which is Jesus Christ is Lord. We may vary a difference here and there and there, but the denominations do not preach of unity in the body of Christ. That's a shame. And Jesus has authority over denominations. We've talked about that too. But just know that there was a time for prophets. They came before the time of Christ. They foretold of the coming of Christ. They were empowered to do even miracles at the time when uh, before Jesus came. He did things through the prophets. Perhaps John the Baptist was the final prophet because he was the last one, the Elijah that was to come to point the way to Jesus Christ. And then there was apostles. The office of apostle is that Jesus called the twelve to go out and preach the gospel in his name as if it was him self-preaching the gospel. Remember, he told the demons, no, you're not allowed. Don't do it. Don't speak in my name. You're not an apostle. You're not speaking my name. But these apostles are empowered to speak in the name of Jesus Christ. And then that's gone. That office is over. It's gone. It's past. We're in the church age. Now the church has been established. Um, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, the apostles being the foundation. And now the carry on of that office or a similar office would be pastor, teacher, those that preach and teach in the church, those that are called by God to uh, facilitate church um, church business, excuse me for lack of a better term, to pastor the flock, to pastor people, to be a teacher to those that need to hear the word of God. I said this before in one of the other Bible studies, that the bloodline of the Christian today isn't the music, it isn't the entertainment, it isn't the building, it's the word of God. So that that position of pastor teacher is extremely important in this day and age. So you had the prophets, you had the apostles, and now today we have the pastors, teachers, and even evangelists who travel around the world preaching the gospel. So Billy Graham was an evangelist, uh, wasn't you know, much of a pa as a pastor because he didn't stay to care after the flock. He preached the word. He brought people to salvation. And then the pastors and teachers would come in and should have followed in his footsteps, so to speak, and taken care of the flock. He would go on to the next venue. So that would be an evangelist to bring everybody into the unity of the faith. So I wanted to look at that today. That's where we're at. Jesus in Mark chapter 3 has told the demons, you are not allowed to speak in my name, and then turns right around in verse 13 and 14 of Mark chapter 3, and appoints the apostles and gives them authority to speak in his name. Jesus' popularity is huge. He's growing in popularity. He's doing great things. People are starting to realize this man's different. What's going on? And now he has 12 men empowered to continue his work, even after he's gone, and to uh, grow and establish the church in his absence. So I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you for joining me for uh, study number 11, Mark chapter 3, and we'll begin tomorrow and continue on to study 12. Have a great day.